Shabbat Shalom and blessings to all of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Yeshua the Messiah. Today is the 1st of January 2022 and really it's, it's my pleasure to start this year with a teaching that the Lord gave me last evening. I believe I finished it close to 10 o'clock in the night on the 31st of December 2021. And I just pray that uh, this message will edify you. It will give you a better focus on what we should do over the next 365 days. And to thank God that he's giving us direction amidst many storms that the world will face. So let me just open up uh, this teaching with what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 133 and verse 1. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And I think, brothers and sisters, this is so important for us, that we work together in unity because we are a body. Today's teaching, or the teaching that I have to open this new year, is the Lord's doorkeeper, and the Hebrew word for that is sure, to be a sure. My favorite psalm is Psalm 84.10. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a sure in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Brothers and sisters, in order to understand this position in contemporary sense, I had to go back to the law of first mention, which is in 1 Chronicles 9.26. Verse 22, of course, in the same uh, chapter 9 of Chronicles, informs us that there were 212 shores appointed by King David. Uh, and the role of the shore currently is performed in these contemporary times in hotels and service apartments, commonly referred to as a janitor, a porter, or a doorkeeper. But in 1 Chronicles 9.26, the Word of God states, For the four chief showers who were Levites were an, in an office of trust and were over the chambers and over the treasuries of the house of God. So it's very different, really, from a transliteration of the word sure to what the English uh, Bibles present as janitors and porters. Uh, and doorkeeper, I, I guess, is the closest. When King David made these priestly changes, together with the divisions for all manner of duties in the temple, he, as a king, wrote in Psalm 84 that he would be a priestly fellow worker and in a position of choice would not be the high priest, but one who would be an officer of the temple treasuries or the temple treasures. The items of high value that were dedicated unto the Lord. Moreover, one had to understand the arrangement of the first temple to get into the thought process of the rules that the priests were given in order to understand the mindset of what King David meant. To the contemporary Christian, this might present a mountainous challenge as we are not exposed to the temple ordinances, nor are these practices performed in this age. Therefore, let us transport ourselves to a period of 1010 BC and understand the layout of the tabernacle which was first instructed to Moses and finally from a portable structure to one of magnificence, magnificence and beauty where the Hebrew word Mishkan, the dwelling place of God, would be ever present. The temple structure was set up in three compartments. The outer court, which was an open courtyard, where the priest would meet civilians at the gate who would hand over their animal sacrifices, which were burnt on a brazen altar in the courtyard. This palace or place also housed 
the brazen sea, which was a massive bronze laver from which water sprouted out from many outlets for the priests to wash themselves after being bloodied after performing the daily sacrifices. The brazen sea was like unto a mini reservoir and was a gigantic structure and towered above all men and was held above the ground by large bronze bulls that gave the appearance of viewing a megalithic structure. Viewing the two places which were basically the world outside the temple courtyard and the courtyard itself, was separated by a white linen wall held up by wooden pegs and wooden poles that had ropes of goat hair attached to them. The top of each pole had a silver hook that the goat's hair was tied to, and at the bottom of each pole was a brass socket that touched the ground. In examining these elements, there is much to learn about our Lord, which I will present to you right now. So let's look at some points, or I would say seven points that I've put down, uh, which will really give us uh, a pictogram of what the Israelites would have seen and should have seen the Messiah when they were put together. The ground in the courtyard and outside the linen walls were the same. Just as a reminder to the priest and the commoner that they all walked on the same ground of a fallen world, immaterial of their relationship with the Lord. The linen separating walls around the tabernacle as well as the inner garments of the priests were linen, which stood for being separated and anointed for his work. The book of Revelation goes even further to reflect that those saved by his blood sacrifice, both raptured and tribulation believers, were both clothed in white linen, which is symbolic of being separated and saved by the Lord. The wooden pole and the peg in the ground. Wood is symbolized by mankind or man, humanity, and in short it represented his creation of men and women. The silver hook on top of the pole. Silver in biblical Hebrew always has to do with redemption. Brazen, bronze, these both have the same meaning in terms of the metal and symbolizes the sacrifice for the sinful human nature of mankind. Esh, fire, under the brazen altar. Fire is represented as God himself, his presence, which has two vital effects. It cleanses and purifies, but it's also one that consumes and destroys. And lastly, the goat's hair. It has a twofold attribute. The first is it symbolizes a prophet, but it's also a symbol of sin in human beings. Therefore, with all the above elements, Let's get a biblical picture that Israel was given some 3,000 odd years ago. The white linen symbolized the separation unto God through salvation under grace through faith. The wooden pole and peg was mankind without God, but with the silver hook on top of the pole, with the brazen cuff at the other end of the pole and goat's hair attached from the silver hook on top of the peg to the peg that was half in and half out of the ground, gives us a picture of the Messiah separated from mankind who came down as a prophet to redeem, paid the price for sin in his sacrifice and was cleansed by the fire of God. The peg, half in the ground and half out, represented his death and resurrection from the earth, thus making it possible for all who believe in faith to be saved by the prophet, goat's hair, who came to take upon himself sin and be sacrificed, something we could never attain due to our sinful nature. I will conclude part one here and part two will begin shortly. Welcome to part two. In part one we concluded with the seven points or the seven elements that 
were in the outer court and what was more important was that the goats here symbolized the prophet who came down to take upon sin himself. Let's get on to part two. Therefore, all the happenings in the outer court represented man's encounter with God in his struggle of dealing with his sinful nature, which would conclude by the washing with water from the brazen labor or the brazen sea, a symbol of the Holy Spirit coming out of the brazen sea or basin and post Pentecost sealed by his fire, which cleanses those who come in faith and destroys those who reject his grace. King David would have understood all these elements and thus desired to be a sure one who would be responsible for the elements that represented God himself as God is represented by the element of gold. If we look back from the place which we are about to enter, everything behind us has to do with the world, sin, sacrifice, redemption and separation. But the holy place that we are about to walk into or should be in had only three pieces of furniture, a golden, silver, a golden seven branch menorah, a golden table of showbread and a golden incense altar. Nothing inside this place had anything to do with the outer court of struggle, but was an area of supernatural light as the middle branch of the menorah, which fed the other six, was called the shumash or the servant lamp that represented Mashiach as the light of the world, sharing his light with the other six lamps as six was the number of mankind. The strong aroma of the showbread as well as the seven spices that were burning on the coals of incense at the incense altar would give one the atmosphere of a perfect world of the spirit, one never to comprehend with the earth. Finally, the Holy of Holies, the only place for a high priest in the line of Melchizedek. And as the high priest was not of that lineage, he was permitted to represent Israel and his own family only once a year on Yom Kippur. Therefore, what would King David's message be to a 21st century believer in being a sure. It would be one who walks in the spirit of the Lord, one who has trained himself or herself to hear the voice of the Lord, as this fact is once more reinforced by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3 that informs all seven churches to listen to what the Spirit says. As today is the first of January and this message was written on the 31st of December 2021, what do I have to encourage myself as well as you, dear brother and sister, to be assured in 2022? As with each day, ever since 2020, the world stage took a very sharp bend and everyone in the bus is out of seat and the windscreen is certainly not giving one the clarity of what to expect as another bend, as another bend called 2022 is fast approaching us. I believe you and I have been spending far too much time in the outer court and practicing the same rituals as did Israel for over 1300 years, thus missing out the arrival of the Mashiach when he first came. No wonder the anointed leader of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus, was told by the Lord in John chapter 3, Thou art teacher of Israel, and understand not these things. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that what we know, and bear witness of that what we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell ye heavenly things? Brothers and sisters, I do believe what the Lord told Nicodemus sums up this teaching on the outer court 
and further encourages us to walk into the holy place, the place of the Spirit in the days ahead of us. I wish to share a few avenues of what we can approach in this year's walk as follows. Firstly, when we read any scripture, for whatever reason we may do so, do it in the mood of meditation of what the spiritual meaning of it brings out to the situation or challenge or for the simple edification of getting closer to the door of the holy place. Getting close to the door can also be used as a metaphor in getting to know Messiah as he is our God, juxtaposed to a God in heaven who is distant, that being on our knees alone just justifies all worship. Remember Yeshua said in John 10, he is the door. No, my friend, the Apostle Paul also went on to remind us of this very desire that he too focused on when he wrote to the assembly at Philippi in Philippians 3.10. And he said this, that I may know him, so powerful, that I may know him in the most personal way of knowing somebody who I want to get close to. That's what he meant when he said that I may know him. I want to know everything about him. Let me read the full passage that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed unto his death. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection from the dead, not that I already obtained or am I already made perfect, but I press on. If so, that I may lay hold on that which I should, I was laid on by Yeshua HaMashiach. Brethren, I count not myself yet to have laid hold. But one thing I do, forgetting the things that which are behind, stretching forward to the things which are before, I press on the goal unto the prize of the high calling of God in Yeshua HaMashiach. What an amazing passage. What an amazing passage. He tells us so much in this passage. Let's look at what he's focusing on. Paul's primary focus was the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit that only rose Messiah from the grave. Nothing else. It was the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit that rose the Mashiach from the grave. But that the same dunamis of the Holy Spirit will do the same for him as well as you and me in the near future. Praise God. Next point. That we may focus and be a fellowship of his suffering. That's so, so vital to you and me, dear brethren. Because once we come to understand that, we can understand much more about his situation in our lives than our situation in his. The fellowship of his suffering. You and I can never come to understand the realization of this fact. I doubt it very much. But in every situation we face, let us open our spirits to focus on his suffering and thank him that ours is just a speck of dust in comparison to what he endured for us. Whenever we go through any challenge, any mountain, anything that we can say, oh my gosh, why am I going through this? That we immediately in the spirit switch to what he suffered to bring us out from this world of darkness. That is what I would like to encourage you with. The next point that being conformed in his death. What does this really mean, brothers and sisters? That the death of Messiah is life in the resurrection and not a hole in the ground, nor the fires of hell for any one of us. He died that painful death 2,000 years ago that we may approach this human phenomena 
which troubles many of us, that came through Adam, but was reversed in death through Messiah Yeshua. In short, in short, human death is a big mountain for everyone, including the Apostle Paul. But that did not stop him in the work of the doorkeeper in protecting what was most precious to the Lord. Not items of gold, but people, you and I, people whom he came to save. The next point. The Apostle Paul concludes this amazing desire that he needs to press forward, in short, the roads that need to be walked on in the future and forgetting the roads that stoned him, imprisoned him, chained him naked and so forth as he had one goal to achieve, the higher call of God. Further, he never said he was saved. He counted himself the least of all sinners, but he said that he had a higher call to serve the Messiah right to the end. So dear brothers and sisters, as the new year is on, and we are already in it as I'm doing this message, let this be a turning point for you and me from the outer court to the holy place and be a sure, a doorkeeper, protecting what is most valuable to our Messiah, people in the faith and people who have to be brought into the faith, that is the high calling of God for you and me. Let me give you something in the prophetic that the Lord showed me for the year 2022. The current Hebrew year is 5782. Following are some of my insights on the Hebrew characters where God's picture graphs paint a thousand words in relation to the numbers 22 and 82 corresponding to the year 2022 and 5782. 82 has two Hebrew letters, Pe and Beth. 22 has Kaf and Beth. The Hebrew meaning of these characters is that this is the year of Pe. Pe in Hebrew means the mouth. The number 22, which is double 11, which symbolizes disorder and chaos, can mean a concentration of disorganization. Jeroboam, the first king of Israel, under the United Kingdom split in two in 930 BC, reigned for 22 official years. King Ahab, considered the worst king of Israel, also reigned the same length of time, 22 years, as Jeroboam. King Ammon, who ruled only for two years and is considered one of the worst kings of Judah, began his rule at the age of 22. The Hebrew alphabet is also made up of 22 letters, which are used to compose the word of God. The word of God is called a lamp, according to Psalm 119 and 100 and verse 105. Proverbs 6.22 also states that thus is the light by which we are all to live. The word light is found 264 times in scripture. When 264 is divided by 12 divine authority, we have the number 22, which represents light once again. Understand that God created 22 things in the six days of his creation. Therefore, I wish to conclude this for 2022. The world will witness very tragically more chaos than the past two years. But at the same time, this year, the year of pay, the mouth of Messiah, will be heard louder than the sound of wailing to those in darkness. And the light shall overcome the darkness in the name that is above all other names, the name of Yeshua. This new year will witness boundaries being crossed as the houses of brick and stone will continue to fall away as the voice of Messiah will break new ground and the voice of prophecy will be heard in a greater dynamic than before as new relationships in the body of Messiah will forge as the year unfolds. The letter Beth opens the entire Bible which is the second letter of the alphabet and not Aleph which is the first. If you were to view the letter bet, it is in the shape of a tent with a flap opened. Messiah is the second person of the Trinity. So bet 
is true. Therefore, every word and letter that comes out in the scripture comes out of bet, the word of God. I just believe that this year we will receive a double portion of the blessing of the word in 2022. My final, final word of encouragement to you and advice, my blessed family, is always look up as your salvation draws near. Be blessed in Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.